As a parent or mentor, you have the awesome opportunity to help a young person build a future. So if the future they want is in the military, take the time to learn more at todaysmilitary.com because their success tomorrow begins with your support today. Attention car shoppers. Right now at South Carolina Federal Credit Union, you can get a new or used auto loan and pay nothing until 2024. And no payments for 90 days means nothing out of pocket going into the new year. Plus, we have flexible rates and terms, so you could make the best financial choice for you. Learn more at scfederal.org slash autoloans. That's scfederal.org slash autoloans. Certain restrictions apply. Existing South Carolina federal credit loans are excluded. Today's show is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's try expressvpn.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash space to learn more. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello once again, and thank you for joining us on Space Nuts, the podcast about astronomy and stuff. That's what it says on our logo, so that must be what we're talking about. We've got some stuff to talk about today. We'll get to that in a moment. But firstly, I must introduce my partner and all-round good guy, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. <laughs> Hello, Andrew. How are you doing? I'm well, and you? <laughs> Glad. I'm fine, thank you. I very much appreciate my full title there. It's, yes. Uh... All it's a jolly good guy. It's on your business card. Uh, actually, it's not uh, because <laughs> I haven't got a new one yet. So I'm still running on the old one that says astronomer in charge. <laughs> yeah, and that ended like 20 years ago. No, no well, it was actually only uh, it was last July. Um, and and it, it's certainly true that I could uh, take this card and just change four letters and it would say astronomer at large. But <laughs> it um, doesn't work because the organisation... <laughs> There's two different organisations, so I can it does, cross. It doesn't that. look real classy when you when you cross something out on a business card, does it? No, no quite so. No, it, <laughs> especially yeah. when it's letter by letter. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I had some business cards made for the for the book and the the podcast recently, and I I handed some out the other day to a rather elderly group of people I was speaking to, and the squinting made me realise I. Probably should have done it in a larger text. Yeah, larger font. Mm, That's but, right. you know, how much can you fit on a business card? <laughs> that is the question. Uh, we were also going to answer some questions today. I'm going to start backwards. Uh, we've had a question from Carrick Bennett, and Carrick has been extremely patient sitting by... Uh, the computer waiting since the beginning of December for us to answer this question about fast radio bursts. So, Carrick, thank you for your patience. I hope you managed to get some sleep between then and now. We are going to answer your question today. And Ron McKay has asked a question about us junking up Mars when we land things there. We'll uh, we'll get to that one as well. We're also going to look at the uh, new international treaty that's just been signed for the Square Kilometre Array, which is very, very exciting news for Australia. And uh, I've got an equation for you. H plus G equals MW, uh, MMW. That's Hubble plus Gaia equals the mass of the Milky Way. <laughs> Do you like that one? Uh, I think that's pretty good. I'm sorry you didn't have an integral sign in it or anything like that, but it's. Um, that's I think, just yeah, too, it's, that's it's, just too much for me. H plus G equals MMW. Mm. I, I, like, I like that. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get to that. But uh, let's talk about this international treaty, the Square Kilometre Array. Uh, they've um, they've signed, sealed, and well, I'm guessing they're going going to deliver. Indeed, that's right. So this goes to the story is about um, an event that took place in Rome, in fact, uh, on the 12th of March, in which a number of dignitaries from the countries that are involved, and that includes Australia, uh, signed a, the, the, the something called the SKA Observatory Convention. Uh, but it's a treaty, basically, an international treaty, uh, which is... Uh, a very great international stature. So 
SKA stands for Square Kilometre Array. Uh, it is the name of what will be the biggest radio telescope in the world when it's finished in the probably the late 2020s. Uh, it's called SKA and Square Kilometre Array because it, it will have a, a, a radio collecting area of one million square metres, which is a square kilometre. And, so, and for, and for uh, the Americans who, who are listening that don't understand the metric uh, system, that's about five yards. <laughs> I think that's wrong. <laughs> a million square. Yes, it's. I, I should be able to tell you what it is in acres, but I'm not going to do that. It's a lot, very large number of acres. So a square kilometre array, uh, it, it's um, something that has been worked on for the better part of a decade, in fact, longer, uh, because both the main countries which will host the telescope, that's Australia and South Africa, although there are other countries involved, um, those two countries have both now got operating Pathfinder versions of the SKA. Um, in Australia, it's called ASCAP, which is the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder. In South Africa, it's called Meerkat, which is a much more elegant name. Oh, I like that. Actually, yeah. we've, we've got meerkats in Dubbo at our zoo. The zoo, that's right. They are so but, cute. Yeah, the, the, what's really cute about this name, Andrew, is the way it was derived because meerkat um, is partly an acronym. Uh, so there was something called CAT, which was the Karoo Array Telescope, and that the SKA, of course, is an array. Uh, the South African version is in the Karoo, which is a high region, plateau region of, of uh, South Africa. So the so CAT was the Karoo uh, Array Telescope. Uh, but then the South African government said, well, we can give you more funding to increase the number. I think it was going to be about 30 dishes. And they increased it to, I think, 64, if I remember rightly, uh, which was great. So they decided to call it uh, more cat, but in Afrikaans, more is mere, so it became meerkat. <laughs> and I can tell you that a square kilometre is a mere 247 acres. There you go. Thank you. So this is the, you know, it should be called the 247-acre telescope, but it's called <laughs> the square kilometre array. But, uh, okay, so um, the instruments, the instrument itself will be spread between Southern Africa, because it involves more than just South Africa, and Australia and New Zealand, um, because the nucleus of it is in Western Australia, but the antennas will spread outwards and will actually, the, the most remote ones will be on New Zealand soil. Uh, so it is a project that is really going to set astronomy on fire in the next, uh, well, they hope it'll last for 50 years, this project. Uh, our bit here in Australia is very much concerned with the low frequency end of the uh, radio spectrum. Uh, so where the uh, South African square kilometre array components will have steerable dishes, here in Australia we've got um, sort of fields of things that look like Christmas trees. They're antennas that just sit there and they're actually steered electronically. It's amazing science. You, you don't have to point it anywhere. You just have all these rows of antennas and there are going to be 130,000 of them all together. Good grief, really? Yep. Uh, and you basically steer them, steer the, the, the beam around so you can see. In fact, you can look at the whole sky at once, uh, is my understanding of it. But you've, got to, you've certainly got to uh, select uh, the objects of interest. Uh, so um, it will be uh, the telescope in Australia is being built uh, actually on land belonging to the, the Wadger, uh, Wadgeri. Yamadi people. Uh, they uh, are the traditional owners of the land uh, and they've had a great relationship with the square kilometre array personnel. Uh, I did mispronounce that actually because there's, there's when you see it written, uh, what you pronounce is slightly different. It is Wajiri Yamaji. That's the correct pronunciation. Some, uh, some of the Aboriginal terminology is very hard to get your uh, your head around. We have some amazing street names in my hometown here in Dubbo. And when people ring up and say, and you're in Wingawara, Wingawara. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's Winjawara. Winjawara, that's right. <laughs> I know Winjawara Street well. Um, but so, yeah, so the, 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 as I said, there's a, you know, the, the square kilometre array and the Indigenous people have had a great relationship in, in, um, essentially dedicating this 
land, which is very has a very low population level uh, to the to the project. Um, and that, of course, it's that population density, the very low population density that makes uh, Western Australia such an uh, an attractive site for a radio telescope because there's no mo mobile phones, no microwave cookers, nothing that actually leaks out radiation. Yeah, not even in Perth, they're so backward. But um... <laughs> Actually, I'm not going to go. It, that. it does bring up the point that Perth, the capital of Western Australia, which is an absolutely beautiful city, I have some good friends there, uh, is the most isolated city in the world. That's right. Um, and this is 800 kilometres further away from Perth. Mm. So it's, you know, it is very, very isolated. Uh, but it, it's um, the radio quietness there is exquisite. That's been demonstrated a number of times by the Pathfinder and um, another a, a number of other radio telescopes that have been built on this site, which, by the way, is called the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. So uh, what was this treaty signing all about? This was what um, committed the various countries, and it's an increasing number of countries that are joining in this project. Uh, it'd probably be something like 21 when you know when everybody signed up. Uh, the signing in Rome, which involved actually our ambassador, the Australian ambassador in Rome, he was the person who signed the deal. Um, it's a bit like uh, the start of something like the, the European Nuclear Research Centre, which we know as CERN, and you and I talk about CERN a lot because they've got the Large Hadron Collider, which is one of the biggest pieces of scientific infrastructure in the world. The thing about this is it's the same kind of deal, uh, and we are hosting something of the same significance, if, if not more so, than the Large Hadron Collider uh, on Australian soil. It will be the largest scientific instrument ever built uh, when it's finished. Uh, and it, it's, you know, it's what you might call uh, mega, mega science, mega science project. Uh, and so this signing really is a big deal for Australia. Yeah. Uh, nuts and bolts, though. What are they looking for? Good question. So I was hoping you'd ask me that because that's what I was about to tell you next. <laughs> Just shows how well synced we are. Oh, indeed. It only so, took 20 years. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> 20 agonising years. <laughs> um, OK, uh, the, the questions really are very fundamental ones. Um, it it kind of starts with the dark ages. Uh, you, you remember yourself after the Big Bang <laughs> uh, for the first, uh, we don't know how many million years, uh, but for the first period of time, there were no stars uh, shining in the universe. The, the Big Bang itself occurred uh, as a big flash, which lasted for about 380,000 years. It was a long flash. Uh, but sometime after that, the universe became dark and it was then probably a length of time measured in the of order of 100 million years before the first stars switched on. So there's this dark period immediately after the Big Bang that we can't probe with normal visible light telescopes because there weren't any stars. So you've got to look at it in radio waves because cold hydrogen, which is what was around at that time, actually emits radio radiation and we can detect that. So that's, you know, the first thing, investigate the dark ages. Then things like how did magnetism originate in the universe? We don't know the answer to that. Um, questions about gravitational waves. This kind of thing will also fit into that. We've talked about gravitational waves before. These are event. These are caused by dramatic events in the universe. The square kilometre array will have the wherewithal to pick up these events in the radio spectrum as well. Um, the something we have talked about several times: fast radio bursts, or as they are correctly known, fast radio bursts. Yes. Uh, they are. <laughs> they are. Um, uh, one of the big mysteries of modern astronomy. So, uh, and the square kilometre array is ideally suited to studying them. These are things that shine very brightly in the radio spectrum for something like three, three or four milliseconds and then disappear. Yeah. And apart from a handful of repeating ones, they're never seen again. So what are they? Are they something at the end of its life that's blowing up in a cataclysm? We just don't know the answer to that. That's one of the things that will be addressed by the SKA and is indeed is already being addressed by the pathfinders. And finally, um, the ultimate question, are we alone? Because the SKA will have the sensitivity uh, enough to pick up an airport radar. I love this statistic. 
pick up an airport radar at 50 light years. Wow. So, <laughs> so, there's, so there's a science fiction novel brewing in this story. I can see, it. I can see your, your brainwaves coming together on what uh, Dunkley Mark II might be like. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's a, it's a fantastic thing. It's got very strong support from the Australian government. They've invested already pretty heavily in the square kilometre array and will continue to do that. Okay. When, when will it be operational, do you think? So it's going to, uh, like the, you know, the kind of already in the sense uh, of the square kilometre array Pathfinder being uh, operating, it will probably come on stream in various stages. One of the really interesting things is the amount of computing power you need because uh, that computing power doesn't exist at the moment. Oh, uh, but it will do by the time they get there. So the estimate... They might have to make a quantum leap. Uh, it, well, quantum leap is always good, especially if you can involve quantum physics. Yes. C CSIRO, of course, is, uh, is um, you know, they run the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. Uh, they will host the Square Kilometre Array Telescope at Murchison. Uh, and uh, the other thing I was going to mention is, and this goes back to your question, uh, it's expected that something like a billion dollars worth of construction contracts will start to be awarded for the SKA, and that will be from late next year, late 2020. Uh, we'll start seeing, you know, in, throughout the world, invitations to contract on the uh, manufacture of, of various parts of it. So it's fantastic stuff it is. Uh, and um, really a good news story. Indeed. We'll, uh, we'll watch with interest and, and certainly uh, when there's stuff to tell about stuff they find, we will tell it. It will be here on Space Nuts. Indeed. Uh, this is Space Nuts. You're with Andrew Dunkley and, of course, Fred Watson. Now, let's take a little break and find out more about our sponsor, ExpressVPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. Uh, this is the one I use. I've been using it for a couple of years and I love it. When I joined ExpressVPN, they were, they were brand new, uh, new to the market, but uh, I read a lot of reviews and did a lot of comparisons. And there was just something about their, their business model that I particularly liked. And a couple of years down the track, honestly, can't complain. Their interface is very easy to use. Their, their service is second to none. Uh, I've had to contact them a couple of times about um, certain things that I wanted to do, and they were brilliant. So you may be wondering why I do need a VPN at all. It's all about privacy. Uh, do you really want big tech companies, governments and others knowing uh, what's going on with your online activity? Even if you're having nothing to hide, it just feels downright creepy. Uh, I think you'll agree. And governments are getting more and more interested in what you're doing every day. And so, yeah, protecting your privacy is what VPN is all about. And how often do you uh, run across websites that you want to get information from only to find that they're geo-blocked? This is becoming an increasing problem, but ExpressVPN solves that problem for you. Uh, now, if you go to our special URL, you'll see quite a list of things this service can help you with, things you may never have thought of before. As I say, it's the one I use, secure, fast, and it just works. Uh, so protect yourself online today and find out more about how to get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's T-R-Y-E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash space for three months free with a one year package. Try expressvpn.com slash space to learn more and you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. Now... Back to the show. Three, two, one. Space nuts. Now, Fred, uh, we turn our attention to um, something that actually uh, prompted questions last time we spoke about uh, this particular thing. Uh, but it looks like there's been a bit of a collaboration involving the Hubble Space Telescope and ESA's Gaia. And they're looking at the mass of the Milky Way. Now, the Milky Way is massive. But we're talking about the mass of rather than the massiveness, which is the same thing. 
Well, if you say so, yes. No, no, no. I'm just making this stuff up as I go along. <laughs> no, it is. Uh, so, yeah, the this is a marvellous collaboration between two of the finest uh, orbiting telescopes, or space telescopes, the, the Hubble Space Telescope and the Gaia uh, Telescope, which is, as you said, European Space Agency. Gaia is what's called an astrometric uh, spacecraft. And astrometry is the science of positioning, uh, determining the positions of stars very, very accurately. Um, in fact, I used to be an astrometrist back in the olden days when I did real astronomy. Uh, and we used to measure them then to, if you were lucky, about one second of arc. And a second of arc, of course, is one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. It's the angle made by a dime or an Australian dollar or a British pound if you hold it up at That's five right. Kilometers. Yeah, we've talked about that before. Yeah. Yeah. So five kilometres away. So... Um, uh, it's a small angle, but this uh, Gaia instrument can measure to a millionth of that. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, so you're, you've got very, very high accuracy positions of stars. And that's uh, of great interest uh, when you start thinking about the motions of stars in our Milky Way galaxy, because uh, you, with this sensitivity, you, you've only got to observe a star one year and then a couple of years later, and you'll see, you'll be able to detect that it's moved mm. because you've got that um, exquisite accuracy there. So uh, that's what Gaia does. And by combining the observations of the two telescopes, and in particular looking for uh, or looking at the motion of things we call globular clusters, globular clusters are globular clusters of stars. They're kind of approximately spherical. They contain up to a million stars, actually. The bigger ones are of order a million stars, the biggest ones in the uh, in the part of the galaxy. We can see are Omega Centauri and 47 Tacani. They're both southern hemisphere objects, so we're, uh, you know, graced with the, the biggest and best globular clusters in, in our skies here in the south. But the um, galaxy has something like 140, 150 of these things orbiting around it. And if you can detect the orbital motion of something like a globular cluster, and, and if they are at significant distances, as these things are, then that motion allows you to work out what is the mass of the object they're orbiting around. And of course, they're orbiting around our galaxy. And it's that sort of calculation that has led to this new, uh, new definition of um, the mass of our galaxy. Uh, and they're going to do what they tend to do and compare it to our one star, uh, star the sun. We always do that. That's right. Mm. We talk in terms of solar masses. Now, um, I, I've been reading a, a little news item from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation uh, online, uh, which um, I, I found a little bit of a shock because uh, the person who wrote it said that the current findings are an important breakthrough for astronomers who had been relying on earlier research dating back several decades that estimated the galaxy's mass as somewhere between 500 billion and 3 trillion solar masses. And I, uh, the reason why that uh, uh, makes me prickle slightly is because I was part of a project about five or six years ago that got a much more accurate measurement than that. Oh. Because we, with uh, something called RAVE, the Radial Velocity Experiment, which I was the project manager for, this was a survey of half a million stars with one of our telescopes at Siding Spring Observatory, the UK Schmidt Telescope. We actually, one of the things we did was to weigh the galaxy. And our answer was 1.2 trillion times the mass of the sun. But that was the mass of our galaxy inside the the radius of the sun. If you think of the sun orbiting the centre of our galaxy, what we measured with our method was what's inside that. Uh, there is actually quite a lot outside as well. I think we modelled what was outside. So that 1.2 trillion uh, solar masses was probably uh, a, a bit of a, an underestimate. And that tallies with what this new result is, because the new answer that comes from Gaia and Hubble is 1.5 trillion solar masses. So we were just a little bit out. But yeah, one one. so what is that? 1,500 billion times the mass of the sun. It's a lot. Now, it's not all stars, though, because uh, you and I know, because we've talked about it many, many times before, that in a galaxy, the, the normal matter, which is stars and gas and dust, is outweighed five to one by dark matter. 
and that dark matter tends to form a halo of matter, material around uh, the, the center of our galaxy in which the whole galaxy is embedded. Uh, dark matter reveals itself by its pull on objects like globular clusters and things of that sort. Uh, and so when we, when we weigh the galaxy, we weigh everything. We include the, the dark matter as well. Um, it'd so, be lovely so to... does that mean the weight is 7.5 trillion? No, solar it means so that, that 1.5 trillion solar masses includes the mass of the, oh, okay, of okay. the dark matter. So um, we, we estimate that there are something like 200 billion stars in the galaxy. Uh, and yeah, that tallies with earlier earlier estimates. It's uh, it, it is fantastic to get these you know these ever more accurate method um, measurements of of the mass of galaxies. Uh, what we really need though is a breakthrough in the subatomic particle world that tells us what dark matter actually is, because at the moment we can only hypothesise that it is some massive subatomic particle whose uh, nature is not yet known. Well, when they wrap the pla uh, rip the plastic off the slightly larger Hadron Collider, or whatever the <laughs> hell they're going to call it, they might solve that puzzle and then we'll be able to go forward. We might do, that's right. It's called the FCC, by the way. Yes, yes. Which is the Future Circular Collider. <laughs> Okay, take your word for it. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the hardest part in all of this was balancing the scales between Gaia and Hubble, because you know it's um, yeah, putting putting the the whole galaxy, the galaxy on, on one <laughs> on one set of scales is a very difficult task. It would be. That's right. I think your imagination is running right. You should be writing science fiction, you know, Andrew. That's I've what tried. <laughs> I have tried, but. Um, yeah, it remains to be seen whether or not it was a success. No, I think it was. I think it's mm. already a success. Anyway, it's a it's a great story, and it it you know it fits in with our uh, understanding. Uh, our, our galaxy is a fairly large galaxy. It's one that um, um, is you know it's a mature uh, and, uh, and and decent sized galaxy uh, that really has, I think, uh, implications for our knowledge of the, the wider mass of galaxies. Um, the, the, the total range, it's really interesting. Um, you know, decent galaxies are in the range of one billion to tens of trillions of times the mass of the sun. Ours is kind of in the middle. One and a half trillion is is a it, you know it, it's a long way from the big end of the scale, but those big galaxies are very rare. Ours is uh, among the commoner garden galaxies that exist in the universe 13.8 billion years after its creation. I think ours is a fairly decent one. It's uh, you know it's it's not nothing to be ashamed of. Indeed. Well, we're here. We can't do anything about it. We can't move. <laughs> so I know. We just have to take it as it comes. Take it as it comes, that's right. Yeah. All right, you're listening to Space Nuts and Andrew Dunkley here, of course, and Fred Watson just over there. Over there. Okay, we checked all four systems and seeing with a go. Space Nuts. Right, Fred, time to tackle some questions and we're, we're sort of digging deep into the box because these ones ended up on the bottom. Got all the other questions piled up on top, so we decided to... Go right down deep and, and pick a couple that had been somewhat overlooked, only because of my incredibly good filing system. <laughs> but uh, first one comes from Ron McKay. Hi, Ron. Thanks for your question. And uh, it relates to landing a probe on Mars. What happens to the parachute after the lander is uh, through with it? Does it just drift down to uh, the Mars surface? I'm thinking there must be a plan to ensure it doesn't fall on the lander. Guess what, Ron? It's just pure luck. <laughs> no, come on. I, my guess is they'd release it uh, at a that, critical time. Yeah. So it, it kind of depends on what the, you know, the final stages of the landing are. So, for example, for, uh, for um, Curiosity, and I think Insight as well, I might be wrong there, uh, the, certainly with Curiosity, uh, the lander was um, it, when, when when the touchdown occurred. It was a combination of different processes. So there's a there's a re-entry, or sorry, not a re-entry, but an entry into Mars's atmosphere, uh, which is at several kilometres per second. There's an aero shell that uh, acts as a brake that slows the thing down, and that's when the parachutes then kick in. Uh, so at very high altitude, the parachutes are used to drop 
or to lower the, the spacecraft down into the lower layers of the atmosphere. Now, with Curiosity, there was then this um, uh, rocket-powered crane that basically took over from the parachute uh, with, with downward-pointing rockets uh, that um, hovered above the surface of Mars and and laid down, you know, it, it lowered down the, um, the, the the lander onto the surface on cables. Really extraordinary stuff. Yeah. That was the seven minutes of terror bit that you might remember from 2012 when that landing occurred. So um, the parachute is jettisoned quite a long way from where the landing site is. Uh, then there are other methods. Um, I think the opportunity and spirit landers, and I might be wrong here, but certainly landers have used this technique where you, you have it basically wrapped up in a thing like a beach ball, um, you know, a, a basically a, a bubble of, um, of of sort of gas, a, a, an inflated, um, an inflated uh, a protective barrier of some kind, whether it's a ring or a sphere or whatever. Uh, so you, you jettison the parachute and then simply drop the thing to the surface and it bounces along. Yeah. Uh, and then and when it stops, it all deflates and the thing deflates unfolds. And up, that's yeah, right. I think they portrayed that in uh, one of the sci-fi movies, Mission probably, to Mars probably. or Red Planet, I think. I can't remember yeah. which one. But that, again, means that the parachutes jettisoned quite a long way from the landing site. And certainly it's true, um, often these days, because there is uh, a thing called Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is equipped with high rise, which I think is the high resolution imaging science experiment. Uh, high rise is a high resolution camera that can look down on the surface and it actually can see, um, you know, often the site of the lander, uh, the aeroshell where, that's been just jettisoned, the thing that, that protects from re entry or from entry into Mars's atmosphere and the parachute. So you might remember, is it a couple of years ago now when? Uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spotted the Beagle spacecraft that landed uh, back in 2003. Beagle was always thought to have crashed on the surface. Yes, that was one of the, well, we, we, we called it an epic failure, but I think they've called it the successful failure since, haven't they? Uh, that's right, because, well, it's Beagle 2, actually. I should have given it its proper name. Uh, what happened was it, it did touch down uh, gently on the surface, as expected, but the the solar panels didn't open fully, and so it never was able to charge its batteries, so there was never a signal sent back to Earth. Uh, it's a British project uh, done on a bit of a shoestring, and that's probably why, you know, why something didn't quite work properly. But um, when those images of Beagle 2 were sent back to Earth from, uh, from high rise, yes, you could see uh, the spacecraft itself and the and the uh, um, you know the parachute some distance away from it. It's uh, several hundred meters away from in, it. In the movie The Martian, um, the the main character goes looking for the Pathfinder probe. Oh, that's right. Yes, and he finds it because he steps on the parachute, there you go. and then he follows the cables. Now, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty well sure that was creative license. I think it might have been. Yeah, the parachutes. Um, jettisoned mm. uh, so that it so probably so that it doesn't actually fall on the lander <laughs> exactly because there's been some epic fails uh, over the years we've talked about it before but i love bringing it up the old um, lens cap melting to the to the camera on venus that's an absolute clanger wasn't the, the lens cap that they had a, a, a distance scale and the lens cap landed on it. And that yes, might have been Venus yes, as well. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, they've, they've had a couple of lens cap incidents yeah. over the years. Uh, so there'll be a lens cap. And then there's the, uh, the poor old Russians who did their speed calculations incorrectly. So instead of um, getting to the moon, they smashed into it or something. I, I, what was well, that, that wasn't um, uh, one of the Mars, the NASA Mars probes, actually. They had half right. the... Half the crew were working in kilometres, the other half in miles, yes. and it wasn't quite like that. But Reminds it's... me of that old Swedish <laughs> ship they built um, you know, oh, the, 500 the years ago, and one one team was using Amsterdam feet and the other was using <laughs> Nordic <laughs> feet or something, and when they set sail, it fell over. <laughs> yep, it did indeed in Stockholm <laughs> Harbour. You can go and see it. It's a wonderful thing to see. Yeah, and, of course, um, losing stuff. We, we've got long a long list of, uh, of things getting lost in space, um, aside from the TV series, which has been revisited, believe it or not. They've made a new one of it. But, um, yeah, just stuff going up there and never to be seen again because it, they, they lose. And there was a recent one, wasn't there, where they just sort of sent it up there and then 
it stopped talking. Well, um, I, the thing you might be thinking of was Phobos Grunt, um, which was Phobos Grunt was a Russian spacecraft that was launched, I think, with a Chinese satellite. Uh, Grunt is just ground. It means that yeah. it was meant to land on Phobos. Um, and it didn't make it into... Uh, it made it into Earth orbit, and then the the command to send it off to Mars didn't work or something, and it just stayed in Earth orbit. And eventually, it came That's came right. back down. That's to, the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Uh, but in answer to um, Ron's uh, question, um, yeah, we we are just leaving this stuff lying around, basically. Yeah, trashing Mars. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but there are contingencies to make sure this stuff doesn't sort of land on the lander, so that it gets stuck in its parachute. So all is well, we hope. Um, now, uh, we're going to move on to another question. Uh, this one uh, dates back to the 3rd of December. And so um, belated thank you to Carrick Bennett for sending this one in. Uh, and it's got to do with something we've already spoken about in this episode, and that's fast radio bursts. Uh, hey, guys, new to the podcast and loving it. Well, he's not new anymore. <laughs> but- was at the time. You might not uh, be loving it anymore, either. <laughs> I, uh, maybe. I had a question about uh, fast radio bursts. It had me thinking about fast-spinning neutron stars. Since the cones that are jutting out either side of the star emit so much energy, could that energy be linked to fast radio bursts? Hmm. It's a great question. And, in fact, um, it's how fast radio bursts were discovered. <clears throat> because um, astronomers were looking for, I think it was a Dr. Lorimer, was it? Is that right? Maybe not. Um, anyway, uh, it was uh, scientists who were trawling through data from the Parkes radio telescope, looking for exactly uh, what Carrick has, has suggested, the, uh, the neutron stars. Neutron stars are fast spinning stars which emit beams from their their poles, uh, north and south magnetic poles, and they act like lighthouse beams. If you're kind of in one of those, if, if it passes across you, you get these flashes of, of radio energy, and in fact, light too sometimes. Uh, so that's what the guys were looking for in the in the Parkes radio data, uh, but they instead found things that just do it once. Uh, one flash, and very bright, much brighter than a, your average neutron star, and um, kind of very short-lived as well, um, of the order of uh, three, two or three thousandths of a second, very, very fast. So um, there, there, there may well be a relationship between the two, but it's more likely that the fast radio bursts are of a, a, a different cause because they're much more energetic. Most of them are one-offs. There is um, one very well-studied one that repeats. And um, I was talking to one of my colleagues last week, uh, Stuart Ryder, who was telling me that uh, there's news now of... Uh, th- th- this is just a suspicion. There might be half a dozen others as well that repeat. And so, But there are far more of them that just do a one-off burst. So whatever they are, it, it seems that they might be two different kinds of objects here. Um, fast radio bursts that simply might be the cataclysmic end of something, so something exploding at the end of its life. But the ones that repeat clearly can't be that because you can't have the end of your life every fortnight or whatever it is that they do. So um, they're probably two different classes of objects here. We really are just at the start of trying to understand these, and it's a very, very fast-moving um, topic. Uh, I was writing about it earlier in the year, and what I wrote is now out of date. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's uh, it's progressing on a monthly basis. So there's more. There will be more news. I think um, I think you and I'll probably be talking about fast radio bursts a number of times this year, and um, maybe by the end of it, we might know what they are. We may indeed. But uh, when you break it all down, uh, Carrick, you've waited three and a half months to be told no. <laughs> well, it's no-ish. It's not it's necessary. No-ish. I mean, there is, a, there is a relationship there because, as I said, they were looking for neutron stars when they found fast radio bursts. So Carrick's pretty close to the mark there. And Carrick, you've also realised that Fred's just too nice a guy to tell you you were wrong and I have to do all the dirty work. <laughs> good cop, bad cop, eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for the question. It was a really good one. Gave us a chance to explain it. And, yes, there'll certainly be more to to tell in regard to fast radio bursts. 
in, uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's written in. I've got all the questions that I think are due to be answered coll uh, collated and in a folder and they're ready to go and we're going to try and tackle two a week to catch up unless we get more than two a week <laughs> as a consequence. But uh, we'll see how we go. Uh, I think we've only got 10 to catch up on, Fred. Oh, but we're good. fast coming up on episode 150, so we, yes. might, we might do 15 questions in that one. I think we probably will. Or 150 questions with one word <laughs> answers. Might be the way to go. Uh, and thank you as always, Fred. It's uh, great fun and a great pleasure. Good to talk, Andrew, and I look forward to the next one. Fred Watson, astronomer at large. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for listening. We'll catch you again next time on Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com.